welcome all visitors who are with us today. For our visitors, we have a tradition here in our parish that at the end of the final hymn, we all kneel and silently say three Hail Marys for those who are going to pass away, who are part of our lives, uh, for the next one to leave. So please uh, join us with that tradition as we help them to go home. We also welcome Father Barry from the Assumptions. He will be sharing information about their ministry with us. There will be a second collection today to help support their ministries. On Thursday, Father Jeff will be available for confessions after Mass here at St. Mary's. On Friday, we will have our first Friday Adoration Devotion here at St. Mary's. It will begin after the 8 a.m. Mass and continue until 8 p.m. As always, please read the bulletin for more information about upcoming events this week, including Father Jeff's current events discussion taking place this Wednesday. Let us now pause in silence as we prepare hearts and minds to enter this time of praise and worship.
God's way. O God, protector of those who hope in you, without whom nothing is, has firm foundation and nothing is holy, bestow in abundance your mercy upon us and grant that with you as our ruler and guide we may use the good things that pass away in such a way as to hold fast even now to those things that last forever. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Kings. A man came from Baal Shemesh, bringing to Elijah, the man of God, twenty barley loaves that they made from the first fruits and fresh grain in the year. Elijah said, Give it to the people to eat. But his servant objected. How can I set this before a hundred people? Elijah insisted, Give it to the people to eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat, and there shall be some left over. And when they had eaten, there was some left over, as the Lord had said. The word of the Lord. One Lord, one faith, 
one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The word of the Lord. Assumptionists have taken it on themselves to educate those guys, to train them for that. 
um, and that costs a lot of money, and that, that's why we're sent around to, to ask for people's help. Uh, I always felt funny on these uh, when, I, when I was sent out to do this because I wasn't in the foreign missions. I was teaching at our college. That is missionary work, missionary material in a certain way. Those, those kids, a lot of them come to school and they're, they're pagans through and through. <laughs> but, um, it, it, later on in life, uh, I got the, the bug to go off someplace. And um, Africa was not the place I felt called to at all for some reason. Uh, I felt like my internal compass pointed north. I used to have dreams about going to Greenland and uh, northern Canada. And uh, one day I finally just acted on that dream. And uh, so that, that, that's the mission I'm going to talk about. But before I do, uh, I, I want to look at today's gospel because Jesus is the teacher on mission. Jesus is the one who was sent missions to come to us and change things. And in the, the story today, Jesus is about that mission of his. For one thing, he's, he's working at changing the minds of the people who are following him. They're all chasing after him because they worked cures. And we understand that the, needy, the need for that sort of thing. We, we get sick, we want to get better. And Jesus had this ability to make people get better. So they're all running after him, and then, and then they're hungry, and Jesus takes care of that too. He, he feeds them. It's the, it's the time of Passover in the land of Israel. It's when they remember the time when the Israelites were brought out of Egypt and brought into the wilderness to go to the promised land, and God fed them with manna in the, in the wilderness. Jesus is sort of repeating that. And everybody gets really excited about it, and uh, Jesus sees that they're, that they're going to try and make him king. And he knows that they do not understand him. And he, he doesn't want to be king the way they want him to be king, and he runs off. Uh, it's not that he isn't king, but he's not king that way. They, they're going to have to see that he's king in quite a different way. And he'll show that to us a little bit later in the gospel during what we call Palm Sunday. You know, that, that, that's when you read the story when Jesus is getting very close to the time of his crucifixion. It was Passover in Jerusalem. And, and there was a custom then, which is still practiced today, that people would gather on the Mount of Olives, which is directly across the Kidron Valley from the Temple Mount, where the temple is built. They would gather there and uh, uh, together process down the mountain and up to the temple. And it's big, big crowds gather in Jerusalem during Passover, and that's how it was back then too. There were big, big crowds. The Romans, the Romans were in charge at that time. They had conquered the whole Mediterranean world. And the Romans were in charge in Judea, Jerusalem. And uh, the Romans were on the watch for any trouble when these Jewish crowds gathered together. Jesus' disciples were wondering if he was going to actually show up on this day because he, he'd been generating tensions between himself and the Romans. And uh, the, the, so the disciples didn't want him to get killed. But he did show up on that occasion. And when he's up there on the top of the Mount of Olives, he says to his disciples, Go borrow so and so's donkey. They come back with a donkey, and Jesus gets on, on the donkey. It doesn't sound like a very important move. It's the only time we see Jesus riding an animal. He was always walking. And it's not like he was too tired to walk down the hill to the temple mount. What he was doing was a prophetic sign. The prophets had prophesied that when the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah, in Greek, the Christos, the Christ, when he, the one who should be king of Israel. When he comes, this is what he'll do. He'll get on a donkey and, and go down the Mount of Olives to the Temple Mount. So when Jesus gets on the donkey, the crowd, who all know the scriptures, they look at this and they say, he is 
the son of David. He is the anointed. He is the one who's to be king. And they go crazy. And they, they tear down palm branches and lay them in front of the donkey as he goes down the hill. And they shout out this expression that we often use. We don't usually know what it means. When they say, Hosanna, son of David. Hosanna is not just hurrah. It's Hebrew and it means, please save us. Please save us. Be the king. That's the way Jesus has himself announced as king. And what's, the, what's the consequence of this? Well, the Romans observe this. Okay? Here's this guy who's got a large following. They've had other Jews who gather people together to revolt against the Romans. The Romans look at Jesus. They were very suspicious of this guy. And when he does this, when he declares that he's king, his fate is sealed. The Romans have him arrested uh, and crucified on the cross. What does it say? There's that plaque on the top of the cross, I-N-R-I, Jesus of Nazareth, Rex Judeorum, King of the Jews. He's killed as an insurrectionist, uh, rebelling against the true authority of the Roman Emperor. Jesus was proclaiming himself a king in a kind of attack on Roman authority in Judea. That would have been the end of the story, except that Jesus rises from that death. And this, if it was a big deal him getting on the donkey, this was a really big deal. Because here you see this one who has stood against the great power of imperial Rome ruling over the whole world, Jesus rises to say he is king and not the great rulers of the great powers that we built. That's a good chunk of Jesus' mission to show his people and to show us that we should not be intimidated by the big, powerful cultures that we happen to live in. This, this uh, understanding of things took special shape for me when I began my mission, which was in the Canadian Arctic. I always wanted to go north. Finally, for a number of reasons, I decided to act on this. And I got permission from my superiors who were very, they wondered what's wrong with him that he wants to go to the Arctic, but uh, they gave me permission. I spent two summers in Greenland, in Nuuk, Greenland, the capital of Greenland, uh, at the one Catholic parish in all of Greenland. Greenland used to be an officially Lutheran country. And then my superior said, uh, no more Greenland. I was really disappointed because I, I, I liked it there a lot. Uh, but it turned out for the better because uh, I took out a map and said, well, I can't go to Greenland, but look, right across the Davis Strait from Greenland is this huge chunk of Canada that I was unfamiliar with. It's called Nunavut. It's, it was created in the year 2000 as a region for the Inuit people, the, the people we used to call the Eskimos. Uh, they, Canada cut the Northwest Territories into two pieces, and the piece on the east was called Nunavut. And uh, there's a diocese, a Catholic diocese, that, uh, is, that operates there. And I found out who the bishop was, and I, I, I contacted him and said, what would you say if I came and volunteered for a summer? And his, his response was, he didn't know me from Adam. His, his response was, you're on the schedule. <laughs> so, I knew he needed people badly, he does still. Uh, so I went, and I didn't stay three months, I stayed three and a half years on this little island called Iglulik, Iglulik, which means place where there's a house, place where there's an igloo. Uh, it's a little island about, I don't know, 13 square miles maybe, uh, off the tip of uh, 
Mount Baffin Island and the Melville Peninsula. You can Google it when you go home. Uh, this is not a very impressive looking place. When, when the plane first landed, I got off the plane to see what I had done to myself. Uh, there was this swirl of gravel surrounded by water, no trees, a little fringe of houses around the bay on the island. And I thought, well, I've never seen so much nothing in my life. <laughs> but it's not nothing. As I got to know the place and the people, uh, I discovered it wasn't nothing. It was really something in its own very peculiar way. Uh, yeah, the Inuit, the, the Inuit archaeologists, uh, anthropologists think that the Inuit came from Asia across the ice bridge between Asia and between Russia and Alaska. And they gradually uh, inhabited the, the Arctic. They, they, they went all the way across what we call Alaska and Canada, went over to Greenland. And they did this 4,000 years ago. They lived there for 4,000 years. How do you live in a place like this for 4,000 years? There are no trees. Now, if you have trees, you can build a nice fire and keep yourself warm in your house and you can cook your food. But if you're living on this gravelly place where it's all ice, where the sea turns to ice for most of the year, where in the wintertime it's dark, the sun does not come up, and it's really, really cold, like 40, 45 degrees below zero, and the wind, the wind blows, you just get frostbitten almost instantly. How do you live? How do you live there for a couple of days, never mind 4,000 years? And I'd like to tell the story. I was telling my cousin, who lives in Worcester, Massachusetts, that this is the way they live, that they migrated there. He said, well, why didn't they migrate down to Florida? <laughs> and it's a funny question, but it's a, it, it's a good question. Why did they stay there? And the answer is, I, I think the answer is, I asked them about this, and they, they, they said yes. The place has an awesome kind of beauty to it, a kind of mysterious, you sense a mysterious presence there. You're in, you're in a world that is entirely uninsulated from this distraction. You're in the presence of the sky, the sea, the creatures under the sea, the land, and the caribou, bears, that you find on the land. That's it. And when you're living in, the, in that sort of situation, it's hard not to know that you're the creature of something much greater than yourself. You know that there is a divine something that's hovering over you. And the Inuit, in the past, knew that. And what do they, what they call themselves? Inuit. The singular of that is Inuk. If you're a guy, you're an Inuk. Inuk translates as human being. If you translated it into Hebrew, it would be Adam, Adam. They see themselves as the human beings. They didn't have contact with other human beings. They were the human beings. They distinguish themselves not from the French and the Italians or something, but from the walrus, the seal, the bear. Their, their language is inuktitut, the human language. I guess they think there's a walrus language and a seal language too, but they're the human beings. They see themselves as the creature designated to rule over the other creatures there in the Arctic. And that gave them a sense of dignity. They were in charge of the created world that the God had given them. I think that's something that they felt almost instinctively. And it's the awareness of that that enabled them to, to stay there, to want to be there. We're still old Inuit guys and women 
who love to be what they say is what they call out on the land, to get away from the villages that Canada built, and to go back to the migratory ways that their ancestors had. I always think of this one guy, Eugene, real, you know, big jawed guy, beard, dressed up like Eskimo's dress. He was my next door neighbor, and he had damaged his foot some time ago. Uh, he fell into the water and got frostbitten really bad, so he, he lived. It was hard for him to walk. He was getting old. He died just last year. I would see him coming out of his house and walking down the stairs, holding onto the rail, and then going over to his ski mobile and hoisting himself on the ski mobile, and then phew, off he would go out to the wild, out to the land, to go camping, hunting, fishing, for days on end. And it wasn't because he couldn't go to the store in town to get something to eat. It's because he wanted to be out there and to remember what that way of life was like. He was a, he was a guy with a deep sort of spirituality. When he was in town, he would always go to church. Very faithful, good guy. They lived in, in small communities. The land does not support large communities. So there were family groups that would, that would migrate. So there was a strong sense of uh, interpersonal responsibility. If they didn't take care of each other, they were dead. You had to cooperate. And when the Christian missionaries first went up there, about 100 years ago was all, and we're talking about charity, loving your neighbor, taking care of your brother and sister, the, the Inuits thought, well, this, is, this is, makes sense to us. And uh, many of them converted very quickly to Christianity. Uh, Catholics and Anglicans are, are up there predominantly. That's how it was. That is not how it is now, okay? Something happened, and what happened is Canada happened, okay? Our civilization became aware of the Inuit, and became they became aware of the mineral wealth that is available in the Arctic. Now, especially as the weather gets a little bit warmer, the ice opens up more, you can get the oil, you can get the, the uh, minerals that are there uh, in abundance in the, in the Arctic. So Canada wants to claim that, and the United States from Alaska wants to, to claim that. Russia, on the other side of the pole, wants it. Denmark, which is in charge of Greenland, they want it. The Russians have 45 uh, icebreakers that they use to patrol the Arctic. They've been setting up camps out there. They want to claim it. And the Canadians have said, uh, we have to exercise our sovereignty over our north. And so they, they said to, what they say is, we have, we have a population up there that's our citizens. Okay, and with people, <clears throat> you are your Canadian citizens. Okay, you're our citizens. We, we Canadians, have a claim to sovereignty over the North. And uh, we're going to make your life better, you Inuit people. Ronald Reagan once said, this, said uh, if somebody comes to you from the government and says, hello, I'm here to help you, you should run away. And th this was the case with the Inuit. The Canadian government showed up and said, we're going to help you, okay? This migratory life, no, it's not good. We're going to settle you in nice towns. We're going to build you houses. You're going to have electricity and heat and uh, fruits and vegetables you've never ate before and potato chips and Coca-Cola and cigarettes and we're legalizing marijuana. Uh, we're going to give you TV and internet and all this stuff. And we're going to put you on welfare. And you don't have to hunt anymore. And the family life that you had before, you're going to live in the cities. One of them wrote a book called Too Many People. They, they didn't know how to live in large numbers. And the result is that their family life dissolved. Uh, the family
family structure is just in incredibly bad shape. And this means that there are lots of kids and there aren't many people who are raising them properly. So the kids are a sign that something is seriously wrong with the way of life that the Inuit have been pretty much compelled to live by the introduction of our, our civilization up there. And all this became pointedly experienced by me in the shape of this one particular kid. I was, I was there in Iglula for two weeks when I was walking on down the street in town and then this 12-year-old kid came up to me and without saying anything else said, could I have an apple? And I said, what do you think of carrying around apples? But then I remembered that I did have a bag of apples in my apartment. So I brought them up and I gave them an apple. And like with a puppy dog that you feed, it was back every day, longer and longer and longer and longer. I would have to push him out at night. After a couple of weeks, he said, uh, will you adopt me? And I didn't know what to do. I thought he was joking. But he was not joking. He didn't like going home to the family he was living with. It was not a nice situation. Adoption is really easy up there. You sign some papers and bingo, you've adopted somebody. But I, I, was, I thought I'm too old to adopt somebody. My salary, I get paid peanuts up there. I thought I, I, this is not the thing that I should do. But the kid, in effect, adopted me. After about a year or so, when one day he showed up, he said, I'm sick, will you take care of me? He got some flu. So I let him stay at my place. And after that, he, he moved in. Uh, he became my kid. Uh, he, he still is. Uh, I got a text from him the, 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 this morning, here from him every day. He, uh, he was staying at my place, and uh, sometimes he would get really, really down. And I would ask him, what's wrong? And the Inuit don't talk much about what they feel. They're silent. But I kept pushing him. And one day he finally said, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what my father did. His father committed suicide. And that's what he was thinking. That his destiny was suicide. And that's, that's when it hit me. This is, this is not good. This is really very bad. And the fact is that the suicide rate is very high and it's often young people who kill themselves up there. But seeing it in the case of this one kid that I knew, it just became really real. I thought that I don't want this kid to commit suicide. And it made me understand how, how serious was the damage that Canada had done to these people. They were able to live up there for 4,000 years, now we load them with all this stuff and they start killing themselves. Canada just took away their way of life their understanding of the purpose and meaning of their life, their awareness of God's presence in their life, just pushed away. Canada gave them all this junk, bad foods that rot their teeth, alcohol, they cannot handle alcohol at all. Marijuana, you walk down the street, you smell it there. And you see these kids, there are lots of kids, and kids have kids. The kid that I was talking about, his brother, his younger brother, he's a dodo, I have to say, he's a foolish kid. He, he contacted me the other day and said, guess what, I'm a dad, he's 15 years old, he's got a kid. He's no more capable of taking care of that kid than 
It just can't, it's just not able to belong. So th 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 there's just this terrible disorder, and, and it takes finally the shape of, of hopelessness, despair, and uh, a terrible sense on the part of the Inuit that they are inferior to us. That we have all the power, or the wealth, or the technology, all this stuff, and that they are nothing. That's how a lot of them feel, and you can see it in their faces, you can see it when they walk down the street. That is how they feel. That's how they see themselves. The thing about the message that Jesus brings is that it says, don't be intimidated by these great powers. Rome, big Rome, big civilization, big army, lots of money, rich culture, fine arts, philosophy, all this stuff means nothing. What means something is your connection with the God who created you in His image and likeness. You look at the story of the Jewish people, okay, they were invaded by just about everybody. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Ottomans, all sorts of people invaded this place. Big civilizations, lots of power, lots of money, lots of class. And they all tried to make the Jews become like themselves, like those civilizations. Rome wanted the Jews to become good Romans. Alexander the Great thought that the Jews should become good Greeks, and so on. They don't. They have this very strong sense that they are the people of God. They were called out of Egypt, out of that civilization. And God took care of them in the desert, and fed them, and brought them into their land. And said, you are my people. And because of that, because they hold on to their connection with God, they've been able to stand up to all these civilizations. It's just a small people, 12, 12, 15 million people, that's it. Beaten by these civilizations, but unbent, they would say to the Romans, the Greeks, and everybody else, three cheers for your civilization. But we don't want it. We have the way that God has given us in his scriptures. And, um, and we're the ones who are going to last and not you. Israeli kids have t-shirts and sweatshirts that they wear that list the names of the different civilizations that conquered them. Assyria, Babylonia, Rome, or Greece, Rome, and so on. With the date of the origin of that civilization and the date of its passing away. And at the bottom of the list is Israel that has no passing away date. They are still here. And they are not ashamed of themselves. They can stand up to any civilization and say, you do what you want to do, but leave us alone. God calls all of us. Jesus is the king that calls us into his kingdom. Thy kingdom come. We pray every day. Your kingdom, not these other things. Your kingdom. That's where we find our place, our meaning, our purpose, our dignity. And from that point of view, you look out on these great powers and you say, well, you're doomed. You're around for a while and you're gone. But the people of God do not go away. And that's, that's where we stand. That's where we find our confidence and our ability to live. The Inuit need to hear that. They need to see that by coming into the kingdom of God, they are not inferior to Canada or the United States. They are raised up to their full dignity as Inuk, as human being, creature of God set over the North.
That's, that's, that's the mission of the church up there too. Show the inner ones, let them see. But deep down they know is that the dignity that they had in the presence of God is renewed and magnified by uh, the work of Jesus in the world. They are called to be part of the people of God. That's their mission and it is also our mission because the same civilization that has been snuffing the life out of the Inuit has been doing a serious job on our young people and us. This is a matter of the greatest significance. Uh, we need to wake up to the mission that we have, to stand up before the flashy big technological wealthy powers of the world and say, three cheers, but we belong someplace else. And we want our kids to know that they are the children of the creator of heaven and earth and that they have a dignity that, that we need to encourage and protect. Okay, thank you very much.
we pray to the Lord. The Lord hear our prayer. For Lug Nujit, who died recently, and for all who have died to receive eternal life, we pray to the Lord. The Lord hear our prayer. For Vera Francis, for whom this Mass is offered for her birthday, we pray to the Lord. The Lord for those intentions we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, our Father, we make our prayer in confidence because of the love that you show to us and the life death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord, who came forever and ever.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer, the fruit of the vine, and work of human hands that will become our spiritual drink. Partaking of the body and blood of Christ 
we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Salvatore, our Bishop, and all of your holy people. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, your spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
have consumed, O Lord, this divine sacrament, the perpetual memorial of the passion of your Son. Grant, we pray that this gift, which he himself gave us with love beyond all telling, may profit us for salvation through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be God. Please join in singing number 606. Glory and praise to our God. 606. <laughs> 